how do we improve financial inclusion in Africa's largest economy? The Afina Access to Financial Services in Nigeria 2020 survey shows that while more Nigerian adults are financially included, national financial inclusion strategy targets have so far not been met. What type of financial services products can provide the opportunities to drive faster progression towards financial inclusion, particularly for excluded groups such as women, rural, and, and northern Nigerians. Well, joining us to answer that question is uh, Unwana Esang, who is the Managing Director of Primera Microfinance Bank. Unwana, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank great you. stuff. Happy great stuff. Here. Yes, fantastic. So, um, a very robust topic here. How do we start off with closing that gap? How do you think we get that done? So, so Permit me, I'll just um, start with, let's contextualize the conversation, okay? And if you don't mind, I'll start with a quote. Of course. On March 31st, 1968, at the Washington National Cathedral, the renowned civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, and I quote, yep. the moral arc of the universe is long, but it tends towards justice. Yes, he did, he did, famous quote. And how does that relate? In my view, the arc of financial inclusion has been long, but it tends towards equitable access. I like that. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and to be honest, I've never felt so positive about financial inclusion and our ability to achieve that as I am today. Okay. And um, as we go into the conversation, I mean, obviously, I'll, I'll tell you why. There are quite a number of factors and accelerators that drive that yeah. and are moving us closer towards that target. And there's, there's also contextual and historical progression mm. that I can speak to regarding that. Great. As well. All right, yeah. let's, let's get into it. So as far as the, as far as the gap, just getting, into, getting that gap closed and getting more people financially included, yeah. how, how do we here in this market, in this area, get into that? Okay, so let's start with a bit of history. Yep. In 2008, we had only 47% of our adult population financially included. Mm. And I mean by definition, those that were banked, those that had access to financial products informally, and those that had access to financial products outside the banking system, but within the regulated environment. Okay. 47% in total. As at 2020, that number had grown to 74% okay. of our adult population. Bear in mind, we have an adult population as at 2020 estimated at about 106 million people. And you can imagine that in spite of the fact that there's been very rapid population growth, we've still been able to move the needle significantly mm. towards including people in that financial ecosystem. Right, right. And that ecosystem is growing mm. and accelerated by quite a number of factors like the fintech revolution that's going on and also the democratization of identification okay. and identification platforms that give each person a unique identity with which they can contract those financial services. Uh -huh, okay. That ecosystem is growing really, really fast. And I'll give you an example. Yeah. As of today, we have about 50 million BVN registered Nigerians. Okay. We now have, as at April, we have about 51 million NIN registered Nigerians. Yep, yep. This is as at April. Right. NIMSI, the Nigeria um, Identity Management Commission, tells us that they have a run rate of about 2.6 million registrations per month. Okay. And if that run rate holds true, by mid next year, we should have well in excess of about 80 million Nigerians on NIN. Now, why is that important? Yeah. To contract financial services, the most important factor is identity. Okay. okay. Once you can it. establish unique identity, biometrically obtained, as is the case today, it opens the door to so many people who currently are outside that ecosystem and who have felt institutionally excluded from that experience or that reality. And that, that, that arc, as I said is earlier, bending towards is bending towards, towards access. Are banks shouldered, with, banks shouldered with too much responsibility to do this alone? In terms of way with, in terms of bending that arc. Yes. Yeah, so historically, that has been the case, but today we see quite 
an interesting expansion of that financial ecosystem. In fact, the definition of what a bank is, is changing. Mm, that, that's true. Yeah. And the truth, the truth of it is, banking as we know it has changed forever. And those other players beyond the regulated banking institutions that we know today, Primary Microfinance Bank being one of them, yeah, yeah. are now becoming a part of a larger ecosystem that's beyond themselves, but which together is working in mutual cooperation towards those shared goals of expanding that space, which will be good for everyone, yeah. which will be good for the economy, which will be good for, for Africa, which will be good for the individual. Mm. You, mentioned, you mentioned banks, you mentioned fintechs. What, what about telcos? What about, how, where do, you know, what did you mention tel Yeah, yeah. So, it's interesting that tel some telcos are now licensed to provide financial services at a certain level. Right. It's also interesting that telcos also provide the backbone and infrastructure for a lot of the um, channels that financial services could be accessed, especially in the rural areas. So of this 106 million ni adult Nigerians, 18 years and above, 70% reside in the rural areas. Mm. Would it be possible for banks to set up brick and mortar locations across the country? Uh -huh. That's impossible. Right, it's right. not gonna happen. And it will not happen because there's now a democratization of access that's driven by partners such as the telcos and the banks are riding on those networks and getting into the rural areas where people, either through agency banking or on their mobile phones, can transact and become excluded and become economically active. Great stuff. So more cooperation, not competition. We're not talking about it. We're not going that, into that's, this. That's the reality. I mean. It's, it's a fine point you raise because at yeah. the beginning, that, that tension, that tension was quite obvious. Right. But we've gotten to the stage in the industry where it is really clear that from a regulatory perspective, a competitor perspective, a customer perspective, we all want the same thing. And so you're starting to see banks not investing their money into some of these platforms, but rather going into partnerships with fintechs, telcos, and the like, yeah. all towards arriving at that shed. I mean, the sky is big enough for all birds to fly, so Great let's stop. fly. We just, in our last segment, we were talking about the e Naira and the central bank's path towards a digital currency. Mm -hmm. What about that? What about the role that could play in um, that? Would, that would be huge. And I watched your segment about that a couple of days ago, which yeah. was really good. That's, that's massive. Now, what's the ENIRA? The ENIRA is basically a CBDC, that's a central bank digital currency. Yeah. And what that does is it allows increased velocity, increased access, and increased circulation of legal tender, right. as it were, but doing that electronically, and doing that through low-cost means, creating better transparency in the system, bringing more people in. And by the way, in terms of bringing more people in, there is something that we are all working really hard to address, and that's the trust deficit uh -huh, yep. that exists between the average unbanked or financially excluded individual. We need to, we need to break down that wall of mistrust, right. and there's a lot of engagement going on in that space. That engagement, um is that responsibility shelved only with the public sector, with government, or does pri the private players also have to it, it do shared. The, Yeah, It's shared. So, for example, I'm sure you've seen certain adverts from the Bankers Committee um, basically educating people around staying safe mm. and also propagating the message of basically just, you know, being careful and being mindful, as right. it were, of how we transact and staying safe in that sense. So. That, that message is coming out of reg the regulatory space. That message is also coming out from us, the players in the industry. So Great. it's shared. Great stuff. You mentioned rural folks unbanked in the rural areas. I think you already mentioned agency banking, yeah. but how far can agency banking take us in terms of reaching to getting to the unbanked and getting them in the pool? Agency banking will help. It is one of the really excellent channels that have opened up. The multiplier effect there being that I mean, think of a typical agency banking location. There's more that happens than 
people going in to cash in or cash out. There's traffic that's directed towards those businesses themselves. And you find out that if it's the mom and pop store in a rural area, someone is going to cash in and cash out, and in addition, buy some supplies. Right. That grows those businesses. That creates room for them to employ more. So agency banking is fantastic. But for me, the joker really is with mobile banking. Mm. Why is that so? Today, we have 81% of Nigerians with a mobile phone. Right, right. And that is a massive platform to play on. And what we've seen recently is that biometric identification through NIN is now tied to mobile phone access. Uh -huh. okay. What does that do? That significantly moves the number, the cohort of biometrically identified, uniquely identified individuals from where we are today, 51 million, that's at April, mm -hmm. to nearing, being at par with right. the number of mobile phones. And with mobile banking access, that creates significant penetration into the rural areas and also reduces, because people trust their mobile phones. It's weird. Right, it's right. an inanimate object, but right. you trust it. You're always with it. Yep. And by the time you interact financially through your mobile phone, it, in my mind, creates better trust with the financial system and helps to reduce that trust deficit that exists today. Fantastic. What about the role of infrastructure? Mm. Uh, mobile phones need you know, yeah. internet service, so broadband, yeah. you know, all that. Yeah. So what about infrastructure and, and financial? Inclusion? I wouldn't go as far as broadband. Yeah. That's for the really sophisticated rotors type individuals, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, I, but, I'll say, <laughs> but I'll say just basic text, USSD services, provided, of course, on the back of tel telco you know, um, networks, will really catalyze that drive mm. and accelerate progress towards the end goal of inclusion. Has, in all this talk of financial inclusion, did, did COVID set us back? You think, you know? COVID, COVID did. And COVID had mixed impacts. So COVID created a lot of unemployment in the formal unemployed sector, formal employed sector, beg your pardon. But what it also did, it, it, it unleashed a huge wave of entrepreneurial energy in the e-commerce space. Mm. And that has salutary effects on the logistics space, lots of booming businesses around your Okada guys delivering stuff. And so it had, it had a telling effect on one hand, but it also had a catalyzing effect in releasing energy in that e-commerce space. And greater trust in payments and digital, right. all right, interactions financially. And that helps to accelerate that drive, in my view. Less than a minute ago, real quick, can that be built upon to get to these numbers, these financial inclusion numbers that you're seeing hopefully improve in 2022? Absolutely, and it's, it's absolutely, and it's happening already. Yeah. I mean, I'm excited. I'm very sure that in the near future, as, we're, as we come back to talk more about this, we'll see a better picture. Uh, a more inclusive picture, a more democratized picture, and that equitable access to financial inclusion that, in my mind, everyone deserves as a right, as far as I'm concerned. Very positive note to, to end this segment on. Uh, Mr. Unwana Eshang, who, of course, the Managing Director of Premier Finance Bank, thank you so much for joining us to talk to financial inclusion.